Welcome to today's segment of The Power of Money. I'm your host, as always, Michelle Graves, affectionately known throughout the United States as The Money Lady. And as always, my show is committed to bringing you information and people that you cannot access, get to, talk to, hear from in any other venue. So as always, I'm delighted to be a part of your world and thank you for coming into my world today. We've got an exceptional show today, so sit down, get comfortable. I have as my guest today an amazing woman uh, who will be talking about the subject of child welfare and about the state of our children in America. This is near and dear to me because I love children. I, I think they're God's gift to earth and uh, so many things are happening to our children today. Uh, you're not oblivious to it. It's on television, radio, newsprint. But I'm going to talk to a woman who has been uh, knee deep and on the ground floor in this very, very critical time affecting our children. My guest today for the next hour is Helen E. Jones Kelly. She is an attorney at law and she is the executive director of a Damas board in Dayton, Ohio. And we're going to be talking about uh, what her background is, her agency uh, mission is, and just this issue of our children and what we're going to do. So without further ado, I'm gonna go on and introduce you to her and let's get started with the show. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. For I'm so me join I, oh please. I'm so honored that you were able to free up your very busy schedule to talk about this subject. You know, you triggered in me when we had lunch, uh, oh, some time ago with uh, two of our friends, and we got into the subject of children, and the things that you said were profound, and made me go like, ah. Uh, because in my side of the world, it's strictly business and money and investments. You raise your children, you do what is right and honorable before God. But all of this going on and these going ons and your experience um, just set me on a path. And I have begun to research, read, study. And while I never can claim to be an expert like you are, a professional, my awareness is heightened. I look at children very differently now. What would you like to say to our viewers oh, that's today? that's wonderful to know. You're looking at them differently. Yes. Uh, that's what I would want to say to anybody. Look at children differently. They're not little adults. They have a world of their own. They have a lot going on in their own heads. And so often we forget that they're real people with real feelings and they're soaking up a lot of what's going on around them. And how do we, as adults, protect them? How do you protect them? We have to be aware of them. We have to be aware. You know, so often people think, well, they're not paying attention, but they mm -hmm. are. Um, they're absorbing anything that's going on in our lives. Those of us who are caretakers for young people need to be aware of that and need to process with them when crises occur because they've absorbed the crisis as well. So often they can pick up on our own emotions before we even say anything about it. That's so amazing. That is so amazing. So when you talk about um, children being able to pick up on our emotions. What do you see as probably the biggest challenge we're facing today with regard to the children? Well, you know, we actually see it with the adults. Hmm. It's the childhood experience that begins to manifest, manifest itself as adults. We see trauma in adults. We see people acting out in ways that we just don't understand. Right. But in all likelihood, something occurred to them at a very young age that left an imprint, a footprint, if you will, in their heads that never was dealt with. So now they're acting out mm. on experiences, that trauma. Um, and it creates for us now this whole new world of uh, focused trauma and trying to understand stressors and the things that occur in early childhood. So a lot of the behavior well, um, dysfunctionalities, as I say, mm -hmm. among adults traces right back to the childhood experience. It could have been one incident. One incident. didn't get processed. To send them on a spin. Right. right. Wow. That's amazing. So what happens? They have children, and then they transfer their trauma into the child right. or their children. Is right. that what that's, happens? That's very possible. That's very possible. Or they simply manifested at some point something triggers for them let's say they something happened when they were six 
and at age 36, something triggers that for them, and they go off on a rampage, or they act out in a way that doesn't seem to fit the personality that we associate with them. Wow. So that is major. It is major. That is, major. is major. So essentially, what we're saying is when we look at children, that because they are little sponges, that um, if an adult presents them with a way that is not uh, socially correct, yeah. they will process it as normal behavior. Is that what That's you're That's very, very suggesting? often the case. Children normalize. You know, we work with a lot of young people who have been uh, physically or sexually abused. Uh. We know that that is not normal, but they normalize it because of their relationship with that adult. And then they go on into their adulthood with that behavior, acting out with that behavior, something that occurred with them at a very early age. So essentially, a child that is sexually abused will replicate that behavior in their adult life? Is that a possibility? It's a possibility if there is no intervention okay. uh, with that child. Certainly, if there's the appropriate intervention, mm -hmm. that child can go on with their life without ever having to have that experience again or acting out against someone else. But there need to be interventions along the way that help the child get over that trauma. Otherwise, it becomes a normal part of life. And that happens with so many, we see so many of our young girls who are on the yes, street now. Yes, yes, Sex slave trade. Yeah, right. Because they've normalized that behavior. It seems appalling to those of us who are not part of that world, but for them it's a normal lifestyle. And they, over time, come to accept it as just a way of being. So without the appropriate interventions in a child's life after a trauma, and we don't always know when the trauma occurs, which is the unfortunate piece, right. because sometimes um, a, abuse will occur while a child is still a, an infant. My God. And it creates an, an imprint. Right. So we have to be really cognizant of what's going on with our young people when we have responsibility for them. Mm. Tell me a little bit about Adamus, that you are the, uh, <laughs> you are the leader, visionary, and head of this organization. What an accomplishment. I am simply a member of the team. Okay. I am. Uh, You're um, so modest. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board for Montgomery County. So that's such a mouthful that we've yes, shortened it. I like that. Uh, we, um, we provide all of the uh, planning and funding for public mental health and addiction services in Montgomery County. My goodness, we now how many agencies is that? Uh, well, there are about 40 agencies with whom we contract. We don't provide the services, but we provide the funding right. and the oversight for those services. Right. So there are about 40 agencies in Montgomery County with whom we contract uh, for the provision of those services. Some mm. of them are well known um, in that they are very large mental health agencies, mm -hmm. um, behavioral health agencies, mm -hmm. I should say, uh, Daymont West, South Community, SBHI, and Eastway are the four large behavioral health services. Then there are a variety of smaller, more specialized agencies that provide a level of services within the gaps that are left. My goodness, that's a lot. It's you a say lot. 40? That's, that's a lot. Right. <laughs> are you responsible for fundraising um, since you are the oversight uh, agency for these smaller nonprofits? Well, we talk about power of money. Oh, yeah. And uh, within <laughs> Montgomery County, power of money has taken on a real uh, context in, in the public sector in that about 30 years ago, the uh, community developed what is called a human services levy process. Okay. We actually collaborate on how we fund social services within this community. It's a public-private partnership oh which is led goodness. by citizens. So okay. we don't have to fundraise per se, but we, do, uh, we are a part of the human services levy campaign. Um, about every four years, we mm -hmm. go out for, for dollars for the levy process. And the com community votes right. on that, the community correct. votes on it, and it's okay. always been supported because within this community, there's an understanding that all of these services work well when they're working together. Absolutely. And there's a need that has to be Absolutely. addressed. So uh, the human services levy addresses that need in the public venue along with some of the private agencies that exist within the community. Okay. So there are private nonprofits that are tied into this system as yes. well? Yes. Oh, that's very interesting. Very innovative. Very I innovative. think that's very, I'm not aware that that's happening in Cincinnati at all. It's the only other community in Ohio where it happens is uh, in Cuyahoga. 
okay, County. up in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And they have a, a specialized human services levy. Ours is more broad, mm -hmm. serving all of the social services And agencies. your funding is pretty well at the point it's passed by the taxpayers. You don't have yes. the challenges. That, now, that's a nice place to be today in terms of that. It is. It is a very nice place to be. There are challenges periodically in that new needs emerge always mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. the demographics changing and, and with the, the economy going in the direction it's yes. going. But the uh, community understands that we take care of our own and that's really that what the process is, is about. That is so wonderful. It, it really you is. You sit in an awesome place, Helen. It's a great community. This I'm so is a great serious. I, I, I will tell you, uh, being that I uh, do reside in Cincinnati and I commute up here to do this show and I tell people Dayton is an amazing community. It really and is. And I have had a, a chance to yeah. interview some incredible people uh, that are here and what I'm, yeah. I find consistently, and not to make my viewers in Cincinnati irritated, but the truth of the matter is I do find a very tight web of interrelationships here that I find to be mm -hmm. absolutely innovative, Mm -hmm. creative and, mm -hmm. and frankly inspiring. It is, it is inspiring. It, it's that, um, I guess, the old way of looking at how we take care of each other. Yes. And we've now taken it into the community, really a more broad-based level of how we support one another with this web of, of relationships caring and, and relationships. Caring. And that's an important way to be able to get through economic downturns. Well. In fact, um, I, I talked about this on one of my YouTubes and on one of the telecasts, which is that we're coming back to the days where you're going to have to take care of one another. Right. And it's not about the classism where because you make more money, you are automatically better than me. Right. Or because That's a right. person is poor, that they are automatically less than me. And there used to not be that going on. I know when we grew up, and, and viewers, just be aware that <laughs> me and Helen went to high school and junior high school together. That's a long time. Um, I feel that back then we were much more community oriented and, and worked closer together and everybody kind of knew everybody and you knew the people that were having troubles and you tried to circle around them and help them? Well, absolutely. And you know, back then we had front porches too. Oh, we did have front yeah. porches. And you know, we talk about children. Yes. Everyone was looking out. For right. the babies. Yes. We had front porches, we had backyards where people played, we yes. didn't have computers, so everybody was outside. And everybody was outside. Mm -hmm. I think about that, mm -hmm. that a punishment was not being able to go outside. outside. <laughs> Can you imagine the loss of your freedom to right. run around on your bikes and mm -hmm. play jacks and have fun? And being in the house was just like horrible. Right. And today the children are angry if you want them outside. Right, they don't understand why I have to go outside. Why do I have to go outside? Yeah. I want to stay inside and watch TV or play on my computer. Yeah. Which is the opposite of the way that we should wow. be raising our kids. That's amazing. So tell me a little bit about yourself. This agency sounds like it's a great <laughs> agency. Give me a little bit of background about you and what makes you tick. Well, you know, I tick because of the work I get to do with kids and families. Oh, that's um, amazing. Even in, <clears throat> in this world, I've been in the Adamus uh, system now for about a year. Okay. I came from um, jobs and family services. My background is that myriad of activity around social services, human mm -hmm, services, mm -hmm. with some splashes of the private sector uh -huh, in between. Uh -huh. So I see the business of human services possibly in a very different way as some, from some of my colleagues because mm -hmm. it really is a business of serving people. It is a business. And we have to be mm -hmm. very smart with our dollars. Yes, we do. There yes, will never do. be enough dollars to fund all of the needs in the community. So the only way that you can get the greatest impact is to be able to work with other providers mm -hmm. and to find new ways of doing some of the old business mm -hmm. um, and addressing the new needs as they're coming along. You know, sometimes it's really hard to say, I can't fund this anymore because there's a greater need over here that I have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So you hope that you're able to inspire people if they need to keep that other program going, that it is such a part of the culture that it keeps going because people have made that commitment. But you find other ways in which to bring dollars mm -hmm. and fresh ideas into serving people because you're in the business of serving people and lifting them up. That's really what this business is about. And in this case, um, it's all about how we serve people's mental health needs. 
Mm -hmm. Do you see that on the rise? A, well, oh my gosh, yes. I just, I, oh gosh, I was yes. telling this to an associate of mine, and I said, there's no way we can accurately and empirically document the number of people that are spinning out of control because of the economic stress of not having a job, right. not having money, and it wears on you, wouldn't you say? Uh, it definitely wears on you. People are having to deal with issues they've never had to deal with before. You mm. know, you've got folks who are losing their employment uh, when they're close to the point of retirement. Right. And they don't <coughs> necessarily have that nest egg built right. up to right. sustain them. Right. Uh, through the next 20 years of the right. retire typical retirement period. You have people who are, aren't able to get a higher education mm -hmm. opportunity because they can't pay for it. Um, you have people who are having health issues uh, yes. related to their mental health issues. Yes. You know? So we're just now beginning to understand that there are probably one in three citizens throughout the community dealing with some level of, of a behavioral health or addiction issue. Mm. Um, most and often caused Ellen, by what I they're not used you're to. you're right. Yeah. Because mm. I see it, in fact, uh, I was sharing with an individual, I said, I have found myself backing away from confrontational situations. Even if I'm right, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. Because you do not know what a person is going through. Right. And right. they may decide to postal on you. Well, you know, people are dealing with so much stress. And yes. we tell people you don't let it show, oh. you know, because it's, that's a sign of weakness. And, and unfortunately, it's a sign of stre a strength just to get up every day. It is. And put on the face and deal with things that folks are having to manage on a daily basis. Can you imagine um, households where people have lost their jobs I after years of service? with no notice whatsoever, and suddenly you've got a mortgage, right? you've got children, right. you've got all of these right. expenses of, of life, right? and you've never had to rely upon social services before, so you don't even know where to turn right. to get assistance. And I do, I do see this more and more, which is why I say that I've, I've backed away from a lot of harshness, mm -hmm. which is quite private sector, as you know. Keep it real, <laughs> cut it to the chase, blah, blah. And yeah. uh, because we're now dealing with humans who are suffering and hurting and their children. Right. And this is why I say on this show it's about you and your families because right. now we're seeing the children. And how are the children being affected? Are you, do you have any kind of observations that you've seen from these changing times? What we see is where families have those family council meetings, if yes, you will, where uh -huh. they bring the children into the reality mm -hmm. of, of their situation, they're much more successful in getting over the challenges. It's where we try to keep it away from them. You know, mm -hmm. if we have a uh, mm -hmm. hardship around money management, mm -hmm. we need to let the kids know, no, there really isn't any. Here's our budget for this week. Mm -hmm. And here's what we need to do to stay within our budget. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps as we save a little bit here and there, we can get to do some of those extra special things. But when we don't explain it to our children, right. don't keep them in the loop, and help them understand budgeting because they need to know. You do need to, need know, to know, Helen, really. that there's not a rainbow. There's not a money tree in there the backyard. There's not a money tree in the backyard <laughs> and a rainbow in the sky. Right. You know, that right. there are reality issues right. that children have to become aware of and accustomed to. Uh, if a family is not accustomed to these council meetings, because so many families are headed by single mothers now. Right. And so you don't have a, a present father in the home. And she is going through, many times, multiple jobs. These women are carrying two and sometimes three jobs during the week, two jobs, and then the weekend, trying mm -hmm. to keep their families intact. So the financial side there, you, you got to know working three jobs, you're not here anyway. Right. You, you can't be. It's hard. It's hard. Been there, done that. I mean, Been yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> Me too. And yeah. you're just not here. So yeah. what happens to the children in these environments? What can you recommend to our viewers? You know, it, that's even more important for mom to find time. Mom, and, and in many cases we have dads who are that single mm -hmm. parent too, to find the time to make the time, at least that 30 minutes of time to sit down and have that one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. with the child. Um, so many parents, because they're going from job to job to job, mm -hmm. maybe they're still in school. Yes. Uh, maybe the child's in bed by the time they finally do get mm -hmm. home. 
Um, they have to make the time. There has to be a very conscious effort on their part mm -hmm. to spend one-on-one -on -one time. We know from the research that the average child spends 20 minutes a week in conversation with parent. And that's even in, in the best household. 20, 20 minutes, minutes a, a week. week compared to the hours they're spending in front of the television or the computer screen. Mm -hmm. Parents have to counteract 20 that. Minutes. 20 minutes. Helen. And it's going down. Um, and Whoa. so we have to Whoa. be very conscious about making time for our children, even with our busy lives, even if we're working several mm -hmm. jobs. Figure out where we can carve out that time. Maybe it's over the meal okay. that we do in the morning. Okay. You know, just spend a few minutes just chatting about their day mm -hmm. and about you know what we are going to be doing, giving them some, some idea of what the routine is going to be and having a routine because that's another important part. Kids need a routine. They Which need a routine. Which is a time to eat, a time to do homework, right. a time to, to, to go to bed. That's right. They need schedule and they crave schedules. Mm -hmm. You know, you can tell when they're acting out sometimes. They're off schedule. Mm -hmm. They're craving the adult to put them on a mm -hmm. routine that so that they understand what's going on. There's some consistency within their life. Well, do you find, though, and I've, I've had this conversation because my, my children said they were raised in a military environment. <laughs> <laughs> and mom had lists and schedules and yeah. tasks and check off and rewards. And, and, um, but I feel strongly, because I've hear, heard this so much, where mothers want to be friends with their children. And, uh, well, we're buds, and I'm like, Mm -mm. I'm not your bud. No. I'm your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is a and difference. And there is a difference, yes. okay? So do you find that a lot in, ter in terms of counseling and working with families where the parents have um, crossed the line of, yes. of, of, of um, boundaries and authority? And how do you find that that affects children? And, and what you just said was so important. Boundaries mm -hmm. and authority, appropriate boundaries within the household. We are not here to be our, our children's friends. They should have age appropriate friends. Yes. We are here to rear them and to give them the basic kinds of boundaries and guidelines that they need and set a set of expectations mm -hmm. for moving into adulthood. Um, we can be their friends when they're adults. Yeah. But even then, you know, there's yeah. still that parental oh, yeah. boundary right. that we have to honor. Right. But as they are growing up, we need to be the parent or mm. the caretaker, whatever that relationship may be, because a, m a number of children are in surrogate households. That adult needs to be the provider, the caregiver, and the appropriate t parental type for them. Okay. Setting rules, uh, giving them espousing guidelines, helping them understand what it is that they want to do as You're they right. move towards adulthood. And you can't do that when you're trying to be their friend. No. Because you've got to say no sometimes, no. and you've no. got to set the appropriate uh, corral around behavior so that they know what to expect. Well, I was thinking about this. Uh, my youngest child um, was at Cincinnati Country Day, and she wanted to go to our alma mater, <laughs> Walnut Hills, because her peers were there, which was her choice. She never, she could have gone there at any time, take the exam and go. And she carried on, and so she took the exam, <laughs> and of course, she in their sophomore year at Country Day, and, and she was accepted. And then she said, well, I don't think I want to do that now. <laughs> and I was like, um, it's really OK, because that's 18,000 I can keep. Right. <laughs> but uh, she chose not to. And then later, when she brought it up, I said, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I responded to your desire and did the appropriate, uh, took the appropriate steps. And now you decide, I don't want to, I, I want to do that again. No, we're, we're, we're right. staying on path. You've made a choice and there you, are consequences. You, now there are consequences. And she talked about that as an adult, how she said, I, you know, I was just a kid and you were giving me choices. And I said, exactly. And you have to learn early yeah. that there are consequences for your choices. Right. Because if you go into adulthood thinking that you can go hither and there, and that everybody's just going to be, oh, that, that's, you, you, you're good. That's what the kids say. You're good. I'm like, <laughs> oh, no, you're, you're not good. <laughs> right. you're, you're not good. I find that also the case today where um, 
uh, parents are having a tough time giving children choices and letting them do their own thing, including their peer peer relationships? A lot of parents, and they talk about helicopter moms. Uh -huh. You know, you've heard that term. Uh, what a is lot a helicopter of parents, mom? You know, that's that one that hovers over. Oh, yeah. And is always making this decisions for the child. Uh huh. That's not a great place to be either. I, I really admire parents who are providing a lot of supervision and counseling, mm -hmm. but we also have to have our children learn how to make choices, decisions right. in life, and then understand that there are consequences related to each of those choices. Um, one of the things that um, has always bothered me is parents who drink with their children because they say, I'd rather have them here drinking where they're safe at home. Well, it doesn't matter that they're safe at home. It's illegal. Well, it's the same thing with marijuana. <laughs> I'm like, same are thing. you kidding me? Right, right, you, same thing. It's you illegal. Are doing what? You know, and then what does that child learn in terms of consequences from that? So um, some parents go overboard trying to provide supervision and, and making mm -hmm, all the choices mm -hmm. and allowing their children to have these adult uh, kinds of situations, uh, certainly before their age, and, and mm -hmm. certainly in cases that are, that are truly illegal situations in which they're engaging with their children. Well, is this a need to be approved and accepted by the child? What liked. is this? Yeah. Liked? Parents want to be liked, and that's, that's okay. Um, but you know, there's a reality. We don't always like everybody. It, you need to love your children. Yes, you, you do. You need to guide your children. Yes, you do. But there are going to be some times when you don't like the behavior. Right. And vice versa. Right. And that's okay because you get past that moment. Right. But you act in love and concern. And that's a very different kind of feeling and right. set of responsibilities towards our responsibilities for our young people. Well, let me share something with you because this is becoming a real peeve with me and um, other women I've talked to, older women, you go into stores and you s hear mothers cursing out their children Ooh, yes, and, and, and saying awful things to their children, little yeah. people, and, um, and one little boy, and they always put the candy at the checkout aisle. We know that because the candy <laughs> position has never changed and don't act up at the checkout. Right. And just don't, because it's just the end of you. <laughs> and um, in more than one situation, I have seen things just erupt out of control. Namely, the child starts on a path, and intervention takes place. The mother says no. And then it just spins off into something else, where she's now screaming and mm -hmm. cursing the child, or if the child is in a store. and. The, uh, the mother's trying to get their attention, and then they started calling the child names. Right. And then profanities. Yeah. And then, and, and, and in one situation, I just stopped and I just looked at her. I mean, as a woman to a woman, I just looked at her, Helen, because I was like, do you not know where this is headed? Right. But what, you know, what happens, what, what is that about? <laughs> is, that, is that a mental issue? That, I don't think that's so much a mental issue as it is a parenting issue. A, you know, knowing how to parent, first of all, discipline starts before you ever get into the store. Okay, mm -hmm. Before you set foot in the, the store, before you get out of the car, we're going in here, we have a list of things we need to get, we're not buying candy today. Mm -hmm. So let's not even bother to ask about that, okay? Mm -hmm. But you can help mommy get the things that we need to get, and you can help push the cart, or you can ride in the cart, and when we get home, you get a piece of fruit because I'm going to be so proud of how well you yes. act. Okay, so you, those are the kinds of things you say those to are young affirming, children. Positive, affirming behaviors yeah. mm -hmm. before you ever set foot in the store. Yes. So the child has a set of expectations. Now, using the store as an example, but in all cases, you should always give a child of your ex a set of your expectations mm. before you go into a situation. My goodness. And that way you can reference that again. Remember when we talked in the car and I said we weren't going to get that today? You remember that? And then that's all you need to say. And if they start that whining, people know the kids have meltdowns. We know meltdown. that. We do. So moms do. don't have to get into the meltdown with mm -mm. them. All mom has to do is say, you're getting ready to melt down, so let's go. Yes. And there have been times when I was raising toddlers that I had to leave the cart. We got yep. in the car, and I had to go back later that evening after they were asleep, mm -hmm. and there was another adult in the household to keep an eye on them. Right because you just don't engage in the tantrum with them. You understand that they're going to have it, 
So you try to do whatever you can to offset it before it even gets started. What about, and I, I have to speak, speak to this because this is, um, in Cincinnati, um, there's a Dr. Victor Garcia who's um, with TED and he's also a part of the core change movement and he's a pediatric surgeon at Children's and he had some statistics on children that was so traumatic, the number of children mm -hmm. that are shot uh, under one years old, shot, 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 not one time, just shot, 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 bang, 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 bang. And mm -hmm. um, the number of children in Cincinnati that have been so abused physically and um, very disturbing. I had him on my show um, when I was uh, producing out of Cincinnati and a profound man. But what makes a parent do this to a child. Well, you know, that again, setting the expectation of the situation as calm as possible mm -hmm. because you should never discipline a child when you're mad. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're at that point, um, you know, I used to tease my kids, I say, I have this nerve, this one last <laughs> nerve back here. <laughs> yes, and you're the working last it, nerve. that very last yes, one. Uh -huh. You know, when you're when you're feeling that way, when you're getting uh, exercised yourself, uh -huh. that is not the time to try to discipline um, and certainly not to physically discipline right. a child because you're going to inflict injuries. And discipline is not about inflicting injury. Discipline is about redirecting behavior. Interesting. And it should be done Let in me a hear calm that again. Movement. Discipline is it's about redirecting, redirecting behavior. Yes. It's Good. the same thing with a child as it is in the workplace. If you're supervising an employee, you're trying to redirect behavior with a disciplinary process. It's not about punishment per se. And that's, you know, we don't even want people to uh, associate that sense of punitive behavior mm -hmm. with discipline because you want it to be as positive as possible. You mm -hmm. want to use coaching style as much as possible, even with a very young child. You know, I watch my, my youngest daughter is raising three little girls, and oh, I just enjoy this gosh. so much. And I wonder where she got all of this, because <laughs> I didn't have it when I was, I you know, raising the I kids know, at first. Gosh, but I know, I watch her redirect their behavior in ways that just amaze me. And it's usually just a word, you know, and she doesn't have to use physical punishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She's able to redirect them, and they move on. They keep going and right. it, at that very young age where usually kids really dig in. Mm -hmm. And when they dig in, she walks out of the room. See, As that opposed was my to that thing. parent that I'm, wants to snatch the yeah, arm. And, I'm and then, leaving now. You know, yeah. You're driving me right. into a place. I'm going to go to my room I'm now. I need to, a time I out. I need a time out. That was my thing. I need a time out for you. <laughs> That is powerful. But for women, so do you, well, let me redirect that question. Do you feel that most young parents need parenting training? You know, I think all parents need some level of parenting training. Okay. Most of us don't get that kind of training. Uh, I know in high schools, a lot of the high schools, uh -huh. they have the computer uh, generated dolls and, and yes. they have some of those experiences. But a lot of the young people who are raising children right now, were not necessarily raised themselves. You know, I've been in those yes, situations yes. where there's always the child who's dropped off at the football game mm -hmm. and then nobody comes mm -hmm. back to get mm -hmm. them. And I always mm -hmm. have the rule, you don't get in a stranger's car, you know. Right. But then you can't find that parent to call them and say, I'm going to bring your child home, so then you're in that dilemma. Well, that, that's not an isolated situation anymore. We have a lot of children whose parents are, are busy. Sometimes it's not malicious. Mm -hmm. They're really busy. They're at work. They can't get away. They're working the kinds of jobs where they thought they'd be able to get there mm -hmm. and pick the child mm -hmm. up, or they can't contact the child by phone. Um, so how do we as a community right. that's assist what I, yes. parents? Right. Right. And it's really through the training process because people aren't trained on how to be a parent. And that's all about the communication. It's, if we're learning how to parent, yes. how to communicate with a spouse, with a sibling, it makes all of our relationships that much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just about parental training; it's about communication and training around how we talk to other people and being age appropriate with that communication. I think that's so amazing what you said about how we talk to other people and uh, the level of respect or disrespect that can convey, be conveyed in, in a voice. 
behavior. Or in an attitude or yeah. in a behavior. Just a tone. Uh, just a mm -hmm. tone. Just a mm -hmm. tone. And I'm seeing, like I said, I, I, I believe what you said about that one in three people is dealing uh, uh, with oh, mental, yeah. mental issues yeah. and, and may even be more as this thing progresses. And because of that, communication skills in many cases right. just kind of go by the wayside, Helen. It's like, I don't have time to talk to you. This is how I feel, and then here it goes. And there, there it goes. There, there it goes. Escalates. Yeah, it escalates and mm -hmm. something that's not so good. It is not so good. And we do it with our children. And we do it, we see it in the public all the time. There used to be places I would go to get service. Uh, I'm going to date myself here. The old Clark gas stations. Yes. For that dollar that you'd spend to get a dollar's worth of gas, and the guy would come running yes. out, he'd clean the windshield. Yes, yes, and yes. Wipe yes, off yes. the steering wheel. Yes. How else can I help you? Yes. Um, you know, and I, I, I always resonate back to that because that was back when we provided service to people. Uh -huh. Now you often go into places and you have to wait for them to finish their personal conversation about what happened last night mm -hmm. or where they're going tomorrow. Um, and they kind of snap at you because yeah. you're bothering them. Yes. Because you want to know which aisle the oranges are on. Right. Um, you know, and it's just, there's just this behavior that we have towards one another that doesn't reflect customer service. And it's not just customer service when we're out to buy something. It's customer service for our internal customers. Sometimes mm -hmm. that customer may be a member of our family. Right. How do we right. talk to them? How do we make them feel valued? How do we keep from making them feel like they're interrupting us right. or interfering with our right. life in some right. way? You know, right. how, do we, how do we serve each other? That's uh, powerful what you just said. It does start at home, it Helen. It does. It does in how you treat one another and whether you're willing mm -hmm. to listen yes. to one. And particularly mm -hmm. with little people, I, I shrink down to their level and I listen to what they have to say. And sometimes what they say is so inspirational. Oh, isn't so it powerful. amazing? Yeah. I, I mean, just <laughs> like, where did they come from with this? It is so <laughs> absolutely mm -hmm. and completely, in so many cases, off the chart. You know, Art <laughs> Link Letter used to have a show when we were growing up, kids right. say the darndest right. thing. Right. And, and it's they do, they do, and even with the challenges today, I'm just persuaded that the community has to wrap itself around the children. Now, in times past, was the church very instrumental? Absolutely. Because mine, mine were, it mm -hmm. was an option. They had to do church, and they had to go to Sunday school, and they had to go to vacation mm -hmm. Bible school, and they growled and all the, but, but it did not matter because <laughs> the car was running and you were going to get in the car and go to, go to Sunday school. But do you see that with the church uh, disconnecting, or I shouldn't say the church, the pe people are disconnecting. They, they don't see the church as functioning in that way, so many of these situations. Do you have any thoughts on that? I do, just because I've been in so many conversations, um, even with the faith community, as they grapple with their relationship with community. Mm -hmm. You know, what can the church do to make mm -hmm. a difference? I was just in a meeting a few nights ago okay. on that issue as we talked about youth who are at risk. You know, what can the church do to support young people mm -hmm. who are living on the streets or in their cars? Uh, and unfortunately, is that, is that, is that predominant? Is that happening more and more? Oh, it's happening more and more. We have this group, especially kids who are coming out of foster care. Okay. They're uh, like 17, well, e even as young as 14. And under all of the federal guidelines for, for housing and mm -hmm. stability, if a young person has access to a bathroom and somebody's feeding them, let's say, for example, your daughters are still living at home and you have, uh, they have a friend who just seems to hang out all the time. Yes, always yes, there. yes, yes. At some point you, you wonder, start questioning, why, their mother? Yeah, why, why are they well, always yeah, here? Yeah. What is that? You know, yeah. and you start thinking, well, you know, it's time for dinner. They should go home. Well, no, they're always going to be there for dinner. Uh, they may actually be living at your house without you knowing it because wow. they don't have a home and excuse me for the preposition at the end of the sentence to go to a lot of young people are living either um, on the streets in cars or kind of on your front porch because they have no place to go oh my and god under federal Ellen, guidelines stop. they're not homeless as long as they have access to food in a bathroom so your house becomes the access center. That's the access center. You know, we used to talk about the Kool-Aid house, yes, right? Yes, right, right. Well, you know, now it's, it's very real because you've got a lot of young people between the ages of, say, 14 and about 24 Ooh. living on the streets. Jeez. Um, and 
where there used to be places for them to go, mm -hmm. there aren't anymore. The churches used to have, they could sleep in the basement, they used right, to right, have right, uh, right. programs. A lot of our churches don't have the ability to do that anymore. And as they struggle with their changing demographics, mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out, well, how do we serve these young people? And then, of course, there's the fearfulness of serving them. There's the worries about liability. What if something mm -hmm, happens? Mm -hmm. So you've got a disconnect um, Is between it about community. Liability? Most often it's not. Okay. People, people go there first. Mm -hmm. Oh, what if something happens, then I'm going to get sued. Okay. But the reality is, is it's rare when something happens. Yes. It is very, very rare. That should yes. not be our first thought. Our first thought should be, oh my gosh, here's a young person. How do I help them get safe? How do I help right. them get to the services that they need? How do I help them get connected? And that's the other piece for me. We do not refer people. We should connect people. Mm, we I like don't that send term. send people somewhere. They don't I, get I, there. Right, right. Connect I like that. Them I like with that term. what they need. I like that. And sometimes we have to put them in the car. That's a liability. Put them in the car. Take them there so that they're able to get mm -hmm. immediate access to what they need. Is a child that is gone through that foster care system. I have seen and read and heard of so many sorrowful stories about mm -hmm. the foster care system and what happens uh, with children that get caught up in that system and then they return back to their families because of the the desire to keep the family intact but some people are just dysfunctional parents right some people are just dis they never learned how they to never parent. learned um, yeah. but I even though I, I was in charge of our public system for so many years, I, I firmly believe that children belong with family. Okay. There are a lot of wonderful, I'm a foster mom. Oh my goodness. There are a lot of, okay. and I'm not saying I'm wonderful, but uh -huh. uh, there are a lot of <laughs> well-meaning foster uh -huh. parents yeah. out there. But the reality is children should be able to be with their own parents. And unless it's a very, very unsafe environment, we as a system need to make sure that we keep them connected with their families because when they leave the foster care system, they're usually going back home in some way, some form. They're reconnecting to the with family. their family of origin. So what can we do to help strengthen that relationship until the child can be safe mm -hmm, in that situation? Mm -hmm. Maybe the foster parent has an open access for the parents to visit with the child. So they're kind of a mediator for the behaviors of the parents. Mm -hmm. And they can role play and they can model what a parent does with mm -hmm. the child. There are better ways of serving kids in the system than always removing them, placing them with strangers, and then much later reconnecting them with family. So okay. we are firm believers that first you try to build the family up and help build those relationships up in, in ways that make sense for that unique child. Um, but the reality is there are a lot of kids growing up in foster care who end up leaving foster care. And going back. Going back or living on the streets. They still Ooh. connect often with the family of origin, but they're still may, they still may be living on the streets or with other folks. They just kind of go from pillar to post because we haven't stabilized them in foster care and we've often traumatized them that much more. Imagine what it would have been like for you mm. to have been lifted out of your family situation, placed with strangers without understanding why. Well, do, does, does someone tell them why? We don't do as good a job of that as we should. Back to what do we tell children? How do we speak truth to mm -hmm. them? Without damaging Without them. Without damaging them. Yes. But so often we err on the side of shielding them from the raw truth. But the, the truth is kids know what's well, going on in the household. So yeah, you explain do. to them, this is not good behavior on the part of your parents. So we're going to let you go stay with another family for a while and you'll be visiting with your parents mm -hmm. but you make sure that those visits, visits occur and you keep them connected and you explain why the behavior of the parents made it necessary to remove the child so that the child doesn't think that they did something wrong because that's the typical response a child thinks that they did it right and that's why they're not with mom mm -hmm. not because mom was doing something right. that was right. totally inappropriate right. So you explain why it was inappropriate so that the child feels at least, okay, I understand that, so I'm not going to do that. Right. But I can still be okay loving my mom. I think that's very, very powerful because uh, many times when I, when I, and I do have friends that were in foster care uh, who were not really, uh, they were severed from their families. Mm -hmm. And there is a disconnect. Their ability yes. to uh, embrace and to touch is is absent 
in so many cases. I mean, I'm, I'm the just most important relationship you have in your life is with your parent. Mm -hmm. And so when that gets severed without you understanding why it's being severed, mm -hmm. that creates bonding issues for you later on. If My we want goodness. people to be able to parent well, to be able to partner well, mm -hmm. we have to help people sustain important relationships or at least to understand important relationships. So the most difficult decision, I, I sat as a magistrate, um, where you make these decisions about permanent custody oh and the my rights gosh. of parents. How do you take a child away from a parent permanently without a lot of information and with a, lo a lot of effort to keep that bond intact mm -hmm. if at all possible? So I would always try to find someone else within that extended family. Mm -hmm. An aunt or a grandmother. Who could keep the connection mm -hmm. strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because one day there are going to be questions. It's like children who get adopted who then, as adults, go back looking for, for their parents, yes, their biological parents, yes. or for some answers about why the adoption had to occur. We have to give people information, even as children, and it's age-appropriate information. We don't have to give them the whole story, right? but we help them understand the circumstances so that they can then be part of their own healing process. Well, I'm going to bring up an interesting stat, and that was the U.S. Census population has uh, determined that the number of grandparents <laughs> raising their yes. grandchildren is, uh, is uh, growing quite rapidly. In fact, that's the fastest movement going on right now, and it's the number of grandparents who at 70 and sometimes older yes. are assuming primary parent parenting responsibilities after they thought they were done with it. Absolutely. So, and how does that happen? I know that they said many of the reasons was drug related mm -hmm. or are their son or daughter was incarcerated or the child was abandoned. Do you, do you have much uh, insight into that? We do, and, and the, the most significant numbers come out of households where the parent becomes drug involved. Okay. And grandparents step in to take the young children in to raise them. And depending upon the parent's recovery process, mm -hmm. they may end up living with grandparents until they reach adulthood. Um, now we have a lot of grandparents who are stepping in because the parents are in the military. We oh, may have both parents right, right. who are overseas fighting okay. the war, and here are the children who have to be maintained. Right. So grandparents are stepping in and raising more and more military uh, okay. children. Now is that a permanent basis because you're not in war forever. They just raise them until the, the parents, tour of duty the tour is, of duty is and okay. And you hope it ends successfully for that parent. Right. Um, but sometimes it doesn't so then the grandparent does become the permanent caregiver for that child. Then you have a lot of grandparents who um, the, the uh, child, may, their child may not be drug involved but because of job layoffs mm -hmm. and they're trying to go off somewhere else and find employment mm -hmm. or they're going to school, grandparents are giving more and more care. Okay. Uh, we see a lot of that occurring as well, where it's really that after school care that morphs into, well, they'll stay here for the weekend, well, they're staying overnight, I'm taking them to school, and then pretty soon they're, they're there. all but living with yes, them. Yes, yeah. they're there. They're so there. there's more and more of that mm -hmm. occurring as well, just because the parents don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of households, you've found now where we're getting back to extended family households. I that I is absolutely well. <laughs> I'm okay with it because my <laughs> grandparents were such an, a major part oh, of yeah. my life. Oh yeah, you know. But what I'm seeing today, though, and is the number of seniors who are widows, because truthfully, the men die early, and so you've got women now in their 70s, widows, mm -hmm. who are trying to raise children. Right and the financial right. pressures, right. et cetera, because the, the law, and you're an attorney, the law is pretty crisp about who is the parent and who is not. Right. And um, how are you finding that? That is, they're just, uh, that's all over the place. Yes. There are a number of, of complications, and you mentioned one that's really significant, where you have a widow who is on a fixed income. Yes, definitely. Um, and who may or may not have been in a job that allowed her to accumulate much of a nest egg. Right, right. Um, now trying to bring children mm -hmm. in to the that household. Eat a lot. That eat a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that Clothing, grow a grow lot, a, you know. Lot. So you have shoes, mm -hmm. 
thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and they're rambunctious. And they are. So you've seven, got maintenance I mean, you issues. know, come on, trying to pick up a child. Right. Is, at my age, is like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't pick you up. They're but, rambunctious, and their school expenses because of, as schools look at their budgetary issues, right? They're cutting expenses, and more and more of that is being now. Um, I don't want to use the word foisted, but rather, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. parents are, and grandparents are having to pick up the expenses yes. associated with textbooks, uh, after school activities, and those things that used to be part of the free public school right, system. Right, right. If you've got someone on a fixed income who's trying to address all those issues, and then wow. not to mention the health issues, because if I'm on Medicare and I have a very fixed health plan, I can't bring these children right. onto my health plan right. and unless we can demonstrate that they qualify for a federal program then they don't have health benefits wow and how you're, do i take but them you're to right. the dentist right what if they get sick and need a shot or right. they need their series and of shots anyway are you as a anyway, grandparent authorized to to, even take, to them. even take them if the parental right. rights are not yours. Right. If parents have just, just disappeared. Yeah. Let's say that mom, and this happens so often, mom drops the kids off, gets in the car, and says, I'll be back uh, Sunday night to pick them up. And mom goes off and doesn't come back. And does not come back. And then Monday morning, wow. here we are. They've got to go to school. Yes. And if mom doesn't come back, well, mom, maybe mom calls and said, uh, I oh. need you to keep them for a while. Oh. Because we have so many young oh. parents and young grandparents. Yes. Who are grappling yes. with this yes. in this community. Oh, well, across the country. That Thank is that absolutely real time, Helen. It's real time. The drug epidemic is really it's real time. doing a number yes. on families. Yes. Where does it, well, I know that the average widow that's 70 in America brings them $695 a go. month. There you go. End of story. End of story. $695 a month. Think of what the rent is or you know if she's in her own home which you know maybe she is maybe she is but but but. right and this is real because I know in churches etc this generation of older people they are having to deal with children that are not only being moved in but the children have emotional issues right from the environment right. they came out of, and I am hearing more and more, and you can certainly speak to this, where the grandparents do not want the children released back to their children. Right. Which is, oh no. Oh no, I got them now. I got them now. And no, I don't want them to go back there. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is so, mm, that is a challenge. Any innovative programs in the time <laughs> wrapping up? Oh, there are a number of innovative programs. Any dealing with that subject? There are. Oh, good. There That's are a good. number of good, them. Good, good. Probably the best program, to be quite honest with you, are the mentoring programs that are developing. And that's where the faith community can really be uh, play a significant role. The mentoring programs, the, the programs that provide support, the respite programs. Okay. If I'm an older grandparent raising my grandchildren and either my child is absent or on the fringes of their lives, mm-hmm. Every now and then I need respite. Yes. I, I need a yeah, break. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so those programs that offer respite, it's kind of like when, when we were growing up and the lady next door would say, let me keep the kids overnight uh-huh. and the parents c- could have an evening free. Yes, yes. Well, it, it's, it's formalizing that um, mm-hmm. so that people can go to the grocery store um, and not have to pile all the kids in the car or go to an appointment so that they don't have to take all the kids and get their them. hair done. Get their hair done. Or go Just to Bible avoid. study. Right. <laughs> right. Without having go a to choir practice. Choir. Yes, right. Um, so it's, it's, it's providing respite care or the mentoring programs for kids who um, need help with school. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and community mentoring programs can make such a difference. Again, if you've got grandparents or parents who are working and you've got young kids who need after school programs, but they also probably need some additional assistance with homework. If I'm working two jobs, I'm exactly. probably getting home after they're in bed. So where are the programs where my child can make sure the homework is getting done mm-hmm. and that they're being able to ask the questions that they didn't get answered in school that day or they may not have even known what they needed right. to ask in school right. that day. And the other thing about a good mentoring program is that it exposes young people to other kinds of activities and it provides human touch. The biggest thing tutors and mentors do 
when they sit down and work with the child as they put their arm around that them is, and talk that, to them. That's where my heart Human is, touch. the touch. Viewers, <laughs> my goodness, this has been amazing. Powerful show with an extraordinary woman. Alpha female, I might add. <laughs> Old friend. <laughs> Old friend. <laughs> Helen E. Jones Kelly, attorney at law and executive director of Adamus Board in Montgomery County, Ohio. Uh, one of those emerging leaders in a tough time, tough situation with our children and their families. I hope you've learned a few things today. I hope you can pass the information on. Keep Helen in your prayers. Certainly keep me at the top of your list to tune in every week for The Power of Money. I'm Michelle Graves, and you have a wonderful, wonderful day, a wonderful week, and I look forward to talking to you again next week. You take care.